So thank you very much for, you know, offering to speak to us about this. And um, I gather that you've read through the report and you have some thoughts about this at uh, this time. And I'd like to just let you kind of start where you think you'd like to start and then we could ask you some questions if that's okay. Is that all sure. right? Yeah, good. <clears throat> um, I did go through the report actually a couple of times and I thought about questions and I think uh, one of the things I'd like to say is how grateful I am uh, for this. You know, speaking as um, uh, the object of the study, one of the objects of your studies, um, it also, I, I, your intention is to really um, dig into the history, you know, if I understand right, to really help uh, in the present time, uh, caring for better for refugees. And I just want to say to you that uh, as um, a refugee uh, 80 years ago, your report has been very, very helpful to me because um, it has helped me to dig deeper into my experience then. Your questions and the background you gave um, has really been very helpful because at this stage in my life, I'm really um, kind of uh, wanting to uh, continue with the healing process. And one of the ways I've found is that um, it's very helpful to face the actual facts, the reality of what's happened. Because a large part of my life, I blocked it out, you know, and there were many reasons for that. And reading your report, I can uh, see the emphasis on the fact that there were no outlets to share uh, what I was going through. And being only seven, when I left, I had limited uh, capacity to really engage with what was going on. You know, I couldn't um, uh, understand or I didn't have the internal, emotional or intellectual equipment to engage on any level. So um, I think this is kind of a big encouragement to me that you, you can continue to look at things way back in the past and still find healing today. So I, I do feel that the work you have all put into this is very fruitful in life. So that would be my initial response to uh, looking at everything, you know. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, that is obviously very encouraging. One, one likes to write helpful reports. That's really good. Yes. Um, and just um, so our aim, of course, was really to find an audience where people wanted to learn about how they to, how they can help refugees today. But it, it is a very interesting that you're saying it's still helping you all those all those years ago. So can you remember any sort of instances when you talked about your experience when you were young or, or didn't you really talk about it at all? Can you remember anything? You know, um, I had not been prepared emotionally uh, for the parting. Oh. And I think my parents um, were trying to protect me, oh. but I'm also aware that there was enormous trauma on their part. Oh. I was an only child and... Um, very loved and um, I think for both my father and mother it was the heartbreak of heartbreaks mm -hmm. and I was also a very willful child and I think that um, in order to get me to go 
they I described it as something of an adventure, something I would like. And yeah. so there was this enormous um, uh, letdown when I actually saw that they were crying when we parted. Yeah. And that was the moment that I went into emotional shutdown. I think my survival mode was to turn into myself and block everything out. And so I'm kind of coming slowly to answer your question. Yeah. But you see, I wasn't emotionally set up to share. You know, my pattern of surviving was to uh, withdraw and even cut off my parents and cut off the past. So I was coming to any attempts to draw me out without, um, with a lot of resistance. But to be honest, uh, there weren't, I can hardly think of anybody who tried to draw me out. No. And I also understand that the situation in uh, England was very chaotic. You know, people were very afraid because I was, um, I arrived in Britain at the end of July. They were, there was always, there was already a lot of fear. And my first days in Britain, it was increasing because uh, Britain was afraid of a German invasion. So there was the stuff that the, my hosts were going through, but also um, I arrived in Britain at a time when uh, the idea of um, helping psychologically or emotionally wasn't really uh, spoken about or thought of. Oh. And you know, uh, the British concept of the stiff upper lip also uh, engaged here, you know, you're a lucky girl, you know. Sure. Um, and um, I went to two families and I can't think of one time when anybody really asked me about my parents or the past or anything. I don't know if I would have been prepared to answer, oh. but um, neither was there anybody at school. And, um, there was, I would say, a certain indifference, you know. Um, in some places, people find it difficult to think outside their box, you know. It yeah. was um, it was not a, a nuanced kind of environment mm. where uh, you would engage in something or someone who has had a different experience. There wasn't a lot of empathy, shall I say. So um, I was not encouraged to talk about it. I wasn't ready to talk about it. And I can't remember being asked about it. That continued when you were like older as well after the war, or do you think it changed then when you were a bit older? Um, you know, I actually continued in being being a different person. You know, I changed my name from Zach, that was my family name. And I, I was encouraged to do that as a child because, you know, there was the fear of spies and enemy agents and anything foreign and especially German was very suspect. Oh. And so uh, at school, I became Hannah Dodd. And uh, I continued that into my early adulthood. So I had the persona of an English person from the Midlands. I didn't have uh, the persona of a Jewish, and I wasn't in a Jewish family. So it was like a, a real break with um, my identity. So it did continue. And I have to say that I would think I was in my mid-twenties before that broke. And the reason it broke was that um, 
all this internal suppression of emotions has uh, an enormous negative effect. And I ha had become aware of the turmoil within. And um, it was in that time that I found release. And that was when I started to talk about my past in a limited way. Mm -hmm. I ask, what was the trigger that um, started you to talk about it? Well, um, it was the trigger was that when I was in my mid twenties, um, I recognized that I wasn't actually a very nice person. <laughs> and it was, um, I couldn't do anything about it. You know, there was a lot of anger. I was very bitter uh, about what had happened to me. I felt very sorry for myself. I felt a victim and um, I hated Germany and I hated Germans. And the emotions were quite strong and I tried all kinds of things to change, you know, and it didn't work. And at that particular time, it was a time in Britain when people were very engaged with um, Billy Graham. It was interesting. I was a teacher in a small uh, country school in Sussex. And um, I lived in Horsham. And uh, this was a big event. And I, out of sheer curiosity, I wanted to hear it because everybody was talking about it. And it was there that um, I had this uh, profound experience of seeing the way out. And um, it was the news that I could give my pain and my um, sorrow to Jesus. And uh, he would take them. And I actually did that. And it was quite um, a difficult thing to do. It was a public event. I was a school teacher, people knew me. And to do this publicly uh, was kind of a, a struggle because I felt that people uh, would know I was a needy person because I had projected, of course, that I had it all together, which I didn't. Uh, but the, the need was so strong, uh, I did this publicly. And I would say that was the beginning of a healing process where I could, um, I think the biggest event around that time as a result of this was the gift of being able to forgive Germans. I, it was huge, it was a huge deal because like my bitterness and unforgiveness was actually uh, imprisoning me and um, the freedom. Now, uh, I have to say that I did it from Horsham, Sussex, England. I did not do it um, in the presence of a German in Germany. That, that was the beginning. And I think it's very interesting, uh, the whole process of forgiveness, because I think that is um, actually um, a very foundational um, experience in my life that brought, it was almost like letting a prisoner free because I was imprisoned in my um, hatred. And uh, so the first step was to do it in my mind and my heart, uh, a long way distant from any actual German who may have been implicated. And um, it was years later, um, that I went back with my husband to the actual place where we had lived. 
We had lived in the Eiffel region of Germany. This was a small town and uh, there had been a virulent um, Nazism there. We were six kilometers from uh, one of the castles that Hitler built. Hitler built, I think, three castles. He actually wanted to build four. And um, this, it, this was for the education of the Junker, the young Germans who eventually, the ones from this castle went to the east and they were leading those Einsatzgruppen, the ones who uh, killed Jews, you know, by shooting. And um, this castle was called Vogelsang, which is kind of ironic. It's, that means bird song. But, um, so this castle was six kilometers above our little town. So the town was influenced by what was going on there. And that particular castle was focused on teaching uh, racist philosophy. And so they would spend their free time in our town. And I think that must have affected the citizens. Um, so we went back to that town. And in an amazing way, I discovered two people who actually had known me as a baby. Wow. One was the live-in maid, and one was a, a, a man who had been 11 when I was born and lived across the road. But <clears throat> my husband and I, we went to all the places where um, I had experienced um, anti-Semitism, really. For example, we went to the schoolyard of um, my first school, which was a Lutheran school. And um, I stood in the playground and remembered the incident that had happened. We were a small group of Jewish students and around us danced all the other non-Jews singing uh, virulent Nazi songs. And um, you know, um, this is something I feel very passionate about today. The effect of words. You know, um, words are the preliminary to violence. You know, violent words breed violent actions. So these were very violent words. And so deep down in my memory was that experience. So coming uh, with this experience of forgiveness several years before, I stood in that playground holding my husband's hands and I asked God to forgive the descendants of those children and uh, if any of them were still alive. And you know, that, that was a different kind of forgiveness than the kind of distant one in England. I was actually standing on the actual spot where abuse had occurred. And uh, that, that had a profound effect on me. And um, I feel like the people I met, like the, the man who had known me when he was 11, and the living maid, I think it affected them too. Can I ask you, Hannah, <clears throat> um, during the time period where after you started this process, after you had the sort of the epiphany with um, Billy Graham, <clears throat> did you at any time um, reach out or have any external help or was it all done through yourself or through the church or how did you continue your process? Did you seek any guidance from anybody or psychological support or? Yeah, um, there were several uh, means of um, uh, kind of enlarging this and deepening this. I think um, one of them was friendship. You know, I had friends 
after that, where I could share these things. A second um, thing was I kind of stumbled into art therapy and I um, created uh, collages after that initial introduction to art therapy outside that classroom experience on my own I started to create uh, collages of events in the past that were painful and um, it was a very a profound experience because when you do art um, in this way which is very easy you know collage I used paper and paint but it was very free I, I, I wasn't uh, constrained to do some internal thing that I felt was a good piece of art it was just very free flowing and I could express my emotions about those events so I did several pieces about the parting with my parents and um, I felt that was very healing and very freeing and in fact, I actually uh, continued with that. It was so um, good for me that uh, with different friends, I actually uh, took some workshops, uh, leading them into the same kind of experience. Because, you know, I was very aware that uh, a survivor of the kinder transport, that's kind of a bit unique. And the people around me, uh, did not have anything like that. But I also discovered in talking with people that most people have stuff that is painful and most people have issues uh, about forgiveness. Uh, it doesn't limit it to national catastrophic events. It can be very private in the home and all that. So I think that was helpful for me to um, engage in kind of helping others as well through my own experience. And then I also uh, attended about five events that were uh, really geared to healing the past, going over your past and offering it to God and asking him to come in to heal. And that had a profound effect on me, you know. And that was also done in the context of a larger group. It wasn't just me focused on me, you know, we were all kind of doing this kind of stuff together. Well, in our report, we very much sort of, I suppose, discovered that, that the talking about it with other people is, is very helpful and and we but we are focusing mainly in the report i suppose about um young refugees who sort of live in a communal setting and then they have the chance of talking about it with other uh, refugees other young refugees potentially or other older refugees and anyone who has a similar traumatic experience but that that wasn't the case with you with you it was later really wasn't yes. it? it wasn't while, while you were basically a yeah. young refugee. Yeah. And you know, as I read your report, I could see um, the great advantages of uh, being with other uh, refugees in the same circumstances. You know, um, I saw the disadvantages of that because they didn't have that kind of parental care, you know, the mm. adult figure. Although some saw that in a teacher mm. who, yeah. who cared, yeah. you know. So I, I do feel that it's very important to have empathetic adults who uh, care and, and recognize um, the person as a person and value them, uh, to have that adult. So it's a, it's a kind of imperfect situation with refugees always. And so what's the lesser, uh, you know, negative? 
Yes, no, of course. Yeah, well, well we don't know either. But I suppose no. when you were very young, you were seven years old. You couldn't have really lived without sort of post, for, foster parents, could you really, uh, with someone who's as young as that? So in those cases, I suppose facilitating communication in a different way would have been good. But obviously it didn't yeah. happen. Um, yeah. And we, 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 we sort of feel it's similar now with refugees, that sort of communication still doesn't uh, necessarily happen. So that that's really that's really interesting. And what what was your education? Oh, sorry, did someone else want to ask? No, go ahead, Andrea. I'll go. What was your education like at school? And and well, you obviously became a teacher, so you you had a good education. Did you enjoy yes. sort of being in school, or was that difficult yeah. as well? Um, my first school was the Evangelische Schule, the Lutheran school. Uh, the Jews went there. There was a Lutheran school and a Catholic school. And, you know, uh, there was the law about no Jewish children in school, so we were put out. So my second school was a one-room Jewish school taught by one teacher, and we were a complete uh, range of ages. And I guess that was a very short time. And then we were uh, sent out of uh, Gimun, the small town, to Cologne. And then I went for a short time to a very large Jewish school. And then in England, uh, my first school was um, a very small school. We were in the suburbs of Coventry. And I would say it was very Victorian. It was very um, old fashioned in the way of teaching. And um, there was no, um, I don't think it's terribly good educationally. I, my first experience was I went with an older girl and I was put into this class and it soon became evident that my English wasn't good enough and I was demoted to the first class but that was actually a very good thing because I, when I think of all the teachers I've ever encountered the teacher of that class was kindly and warm I think it's not even absolutely necessary that the teacher or the adult figure understands everything about your background. It's just, are they a kind person? Are they empathetic? Uh, do they uh, love people? And I mean, she really did. And I think that was a bright light for me. I won a scholarship to the local high school and then something really uh, strange occurred. You would think that having won a scholarship I would really be enthusiastic about school and I would work really hard. And in fact, I was very resistant to education and I did, I tried to get away with doing as little as possible, which is very interesting. I think it was all part of the inner turmoil. And the really, the family I was with were not educated in, a, in that sense. And they did not encourage me or show an interest. There was no adult who um, could help me out to a better way of looking at things. And so I messed about. And then um, when I got to be 15, suddenly I engaged. And I was very enthusiastic and worked terribly hard. But then at 16, I had to leave. I didn't want to. I was really keen on learning by this time, but uh, the family that I was with said I had to go to work. Um, and so I went to work. And um, actually there was a gap between leaving school and entering teacher training college. And I did that kind of on my own initiative. And I was very enthusiastic about what I learned there. So I was kind of a late bloomer, if you think, in education. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a common story, it seems, about being discouraged with education and then going into 
teaching or nursing or something of that sort. Um, <clears throat> were there any um, skills that you had developed by that time that helped you manage this transition in your life? Did you, you know, I don't know if I'm being clear, but um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to understand what, what helped you in pushing yourself into education again after you had left it. I think that's a very penetrating question, actually. And, you know, I don't know if I'm accurate in saying this, but when I think about it, I think I am actually a leader and I am, um, I don't know if my early experiences caused me to be um, very focused if I get this thought to really pursue it. Um, but, and I think this, the measure of healing, which was only the beginning at that time, the very, very beginning, um, just drove me um, and gave me the push. Um, when I look back, I think that's really interesting that I pursued that and there was no one to encourage me. I would say the biggest encouragement was the Labour government in Britain because um, the Labour government gave money um, to those who wanted to go to college or university. So I had the provision, the financial provision to do it. And I took advantage of that, you know. How did you learn about that? I don't know, I don't know. You know, I don't know that I was so alert to everything. What I know about myself now is that I'm very, very interested in all that's going on in the world in different countries and the kind of movements. And the, so I don't know if that was, you know, we didn't, you know, there wasn't all that communication going on. Mm -hmm. Did you read the papers? Yeah, but we didn't have good papers. You know, the family that I live with had the Daily Mirror. Can you believe that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I guess, um, do, you, do you feel, though, that you were given sort of any routines that were similar to when you first came to England, house, home routines that facilitated you settling in? Do you think that helped in any way, or was that not present? Routines, that is a good question. You know, the first family that I went to, um, actually it was a very kindly environment. And um, I was, um, they said they couldn't cope with me. I had behavior problems. And so I was put into the second family with the reputation that I was difficult. And they themselves, I don't think, were emotionally um, whole. And they were pretty harsh. So the routines were actually negative uh, to developing those things because it was very controlling and with many boundaries and limitations, um, even uh, to food. You know, you had to eat everything on your plate. And I can remember sitting for a long time with uh, food that I didn't like until I actually finally ate it. You know, it was that kind of harsh environment, which is actually a, really a negative influence as far as having initiative. Do you recall, uh, do you know what your, quote, bad behaviors were? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I had been an only child and I was incredibly spoiled by my parents. My parents were older when I was born. Uh, it was my father's first wife had died 
And so uh, my mother was his second wife. So uh, this child, me, that was, you know, they, they were over the moon about that. And so coming from an environment where everything I wished and desired was fulfilled and a lot of, um, you know, in, I don't know if this is too much of a generalization, but in a Jewish home, there's a lot of emotion and touching and um, inclusion. So uh, the first family I went to, um, in the end, I think they had a troubled marriage. And, um, but I think they treated me nicely and they had a little boy my age who was really lovely and that was very pleasant. But I think I expressed my trauma and loss. And um, one piece of bad behavior I remember, uh, my um, uh, luggage included everything I might need, including an enema um, thing. <laughs> and I filled it with water and I squirted the ceiling down the stairs. And that's one thing I remember doing. So you're mischievous. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you had any contact with either of these families in the, in the present day? Um, the first family I lost touch with. And then when I started to write my book, I became very engaged in trying to uh, make contact with every little part that I could remember. And with a lot of research, I um, came into contact with the little boy. Oh. And now, you know, I'm 88 and I wrote the book maybe when I was, I started to write when I was maybe 70, early 70s. So you see, all the people have died. There's nothing today. But uh, he was the one who told me that he, after I, he said his mother was heartbroken when I left. And according to the, the family story, who knows what's true and what's remembered, but according to the family story, she thought I, she needed relief and I was just going for a couple of weeks and it wasn't permanent. But I think she had a breakdown afterwards and there was a divorce. So it was a, it was a needy family, a kindly needy family. And, um, but he was a lovely person and we had several exchanges by, by um, letter and then a phone call. And the second family, um, they have all died, but again, in an amazing way, since the book was published, they had one son and their granddaughter um, contacted me because her daughter did a research on the internet to try and find out about the grandfather, which was the father of the family when I entered, because um, I think he was a very troubled man. And there was um, uh, a kind of falling out between the father and his son. And his son and family all went to Australia. It's complicated. But the granddaughter wanted to find out what really happened. And so in her research on the internet, she found my book. And so she read the book and contacted me. So I've been in correspondence wow. with the, the granddaughter. And have they given you, has she provided any information that shed a different light on your, on the family from when you were there? Um, she um, only knew them as a child before she went to Australia. And you see, she was looking to me to tell her. So it's the other way around. <laughs> yes, but um, she, I think she was trying to understand why the, uh, the, her, her father's father um, 
uh, was so um, angry with her own father, you know, it was, she was trying to understand. So what that shed light to me was, um, you know, I was in an um, emotionally unhealthy environment. That's what it told me. Yeah. And you went from that home to, to what kind of um, housing? Um, I left that home to go to college. And then after that, I uh, shared an apartment with a friend. We were both teachers at the same school. And that's when we lived in Horsham. Okay. Did you, um, <clears throat> did you associate with other survivors or refugees? Um, you know, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the whole uh, thing of the Christadelphians part yeah. in the rescue. So you see, I was a part of a group of, a small group who went to the Midlands and in the Coventry area. And we would meet very occasionally, but not in depth. And actually most of that group, um, two of them emigrated to America um, to meet up with other family members. So I have not had a lot of contact I did go to the kinder transport reunion in Britain um, and that was a very profound experience because I actually met two from that group again. Wow. But so aside from the Christadelphian group, you didn't associate with other refugees during the early years or you no. didn't have friends who were refugees or... No. No. So all your relationships are with English people? Yeah. And do you think that helped you assimilate and to adapt? Yes, because um, I, when you say assimilate and adapt, that sounds so positive. But you <laughs> see, what I did, um, I assimilated and adapted, uh, like becoming an English person. You know, I... I um, kind of cut off who I really was. And so uh, sometimes that also brought in a conflict because you see, I was a German Jew and I think uh, there are ways of interrelating and also experiencing life that is much more uh, kind of lively and um, expressive. And I was trying to adapt uh, to an English way of behavior. So that actually brought conflict. And so part of my healing has been the release to be who I really am, you know. So what were those specific behaviors you, you think you adopted to become British? Um, well, always, not always to say what you really think, you know, not blurt it out. And, um, you know, there is a kind of emotional distancing. I think um, from my Jewish background, you get much closer and you, um, you let it all out, you know, negative and, and positive. Whereas I felt I had to put um, a kind of um, persona over that, you know, a much more uh, polite, and respectable and, um, you know, formal thing. So when you started releasing from this, this British persona, do you feel you're still accepted or do you feel that it was <clears throat> difficult for the people around you? You know, uh, my release came outside Britain. Okay. And I have to say on the positive side, whenever I am uh, interacting closely with British people in the last years, there's something special because I think I have absorbed some of the really good uh, English uh, ways. I think, first of all, the sense of humor and just the way of talking together. And whenever I have that experience, because now I'm living in America, 
But whenever I have um, interchanges with British people I've seen over the years, I kind of click into that and it's very comfortable. So I'm like this um, person of rather different um, cultural identities because actually when I'm in Germany, there are many things in Germany that I now, I really feel at home. There are things in the food and eat. I feel very comfortable in how they look at life and how we exchange. So it's made me comfortable with British and German. <coughs> but, you know, my life has also been very international because um, after I, I stopped teaching, I joined an international movement and I was married in India and I lived in India for many years. Oh. And then for many years, I was on an international ship my husband was the director. It was like um, a, a youth movement. And we had 30 different uh, countries represented. So, <clears throat> you know, I've been very blessed to uh, kind of have this feeling of comfort in many cultures. Yeah. And I sometimes wonder if all those early days when I was pulled out of my comfort zone, it was also a preparation for the rest of my life, you know. Yeah. It sounds like... Um, when did you move to America then? Not until the 80s, the early 80s. Right. And have you found that uh, easy to adapt to? Um, in many ways, yes. You know, my husband's American, but he comes from the East Coast. He was born in Virginia. And when we came to America, we went to California. And now we've been living in Arizona for the last years. And um, I think in the West, I feel uh, somewhat freer. I think there are differences in different parts of America. And also, I think uh, I feel very at home here because of the deep friendships that I have here. I think that makes a lot of difference if you can have um, intimate friendships in a country. Yeah. You can ask, how do you identify yourself now, if you were to describe yourself? Um, that's complicated. Yes, <laughs> it is. Um, I like to say that I'm a German Jew uh, who's actually a follower of the Messiah. And um, I have a, a British passport and I have actually now a German passport because when the German government uh, made it possible for um, German um, Holocaust survivors to get their identity back, I got it. And I have a green card. <laughs> um, did you have any children at all? No, no, we're childless. Yeah. So you didn't have that issue to deal with? No, no. But it's a loss. That's a big loss. It feels a loss to yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if we were sort of talk a little bit more of what we talked about in our report, I suppose we've we've already talked a little bit about how how you know connecting your your early life with the later life that's generally beneficial. And I mean, in some ways, you've done that. I mean, you haven't done that in maybe in your early life. You weren't giving the opportunity to talk about your experience, but later on, you've done that, haven't you? Because you have when you have a German passport, for example, so that's obviously a decision you made and, and you have written about uh, your experience. Is there still something that you feel you haven't done in that, in relation of connecting various sort of phases of your life that you would have liked to do or what do you think you've, you've successfully managed to integrate these different phases? 
Um, I think a huge deal was writing my book. Okay. That was a huge deal in the healing process and in freeing me to be, to say yes, that was my history, that's what happened, oh. and to accept it and to express it. And I spent a number of years writing and I did a lot of uh, research. And, um, you know, I talked about visiting Germany and going to the places where um, uh, that had memories for me. But um, I also uh, went uh, to my father's birthplace in Poland. And that was a very uh, big deal to go back there. And I went back to my mother's home, which was in near Bad Kreuznach, you know, a little bit west of the Rhine. And um, I think a huge event in uh, writing the book and in also travels uh, is going to places where things happened. And uh, with my husband and eight other friends, there were 10 of us, uh, we uh, made the journey following the footsteps of my parents to their end. Because a, a big fact for me was not really knowing what happened to my parents, not having the exact information. But uh, in the process of writing the book and doing research, we got the facts and they died in Chelmno, which is um, kind of some miles, some kilometers from the Lot's ghetto. They were in the Lot's ghetto. So the 10 of us made the journey by train uh, along their route to the Lot's ghetto and to Chelmno. And so, um, the identifying with my parents and their experience and also um, doing a lot of reading. It was very difficult to find um, in the early 80s because uh, it's not like now where so much is on the internet. But, so you had to work really hard to get facts, but I could get the facts and really, you see, I hadn't really grieved my parents or mourned for them, uh, but it was like, this was the time to do it on that journey. And to actually, uh, go, we found the place in the forest um, where the incinerator had been excavated, which was an amazing thing because, you know, Poland under communists and under the control of Russia, all those things were covered up. And so those were more recent uh, discoveries. And uh, that, that was a huge part of uh, healing and also freeing to talk about things. And um, since that time, uh, it's been very, um, I, I kind of wonder about it always, filled with wonder because um, going back uh, to places of memory and being able to speak about what happened. One example is, um, I don't know if you've heard of the World Youth Day. It's actually a Catholic event where young people uh, come to a city that is chosen uh, for a week of events. Well, on this particular World Youth Day, they had, um, a pre-event of events of one week. It was going to be in Warsaw, but they had one week in Lotz, which is the place, of course, where my parents were in the ghetto. And um, I had written my book, and one of the leaders who was preparing the Lotz event just happened to get my book during this time. And he realized that my parents had been uh, contained in Lot's ghetto. 
And he approached me and asked me if I would come and tell my story at this event. So this was an amazing experience to be able to share about my parents and what happened to them to, I think it was 5,000 young people coming from different countries in lots itself. And then at the end of those days, a small group of these young people went with me to Chumno and um, we actually visited um, what had been the place where their truck had, where they had been um, brought, entered the truck to be gassed before they went into the forest. And I could meet with this small group. And there were three European young women who actually sang in Hebrew. And um, that was just a lot of um, comfort in that experience. So the, the speaking out, it's not that I've particularly sought it, but, but in these amazing ways, I've been invited to do it. And because it came that way, it wasn't that I was trying to do this. There was a kind of peace about doing it, you know, because it was... I mean, that's quite um, an emotionally challenging uh, event. Can I ask you, when did you first learn that your parents had died or were killed? Um, you know, um, I was maybe about 16 or 17 years old, and I got a letter from the Red Cross. So you didn't know all those years. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, would it have made a difference if you had known as things developed what the situation was for your parents? I mean, were you, were you at all concerned or absorbed in thinking about what was happening to your parents? Or did you just push them away? And You know, um, I think... It was too painful to think about. I, so I blocked it. Okay. Uh, and plus, you know, really uh, looking back with uh, insight, I felt abandoned, which is very um, strange because, you know, I had no concept of their pain or the amount of love it took to send me into the unknown because they didn't have people ready to receive me. I mean, this it's a measure of how desperate they were that they did it because, you know, they didn't know what would happen. Yeah. But it was, so it must have been a concept of great evil that would come if they didn't do it. So I didn't engage with that. And so... Um, not knowing was actually uh, more comfortable than knowing, you know, because you were blocking it all out. So, um, and it was kind of a bit um, strange what the Red Cross told me had happened to them. You know, um, it was misinformation. Sometimes, um, information that um, is placed in the Yad Vashem records comes from uh, distant relatives or friends who report it. They fill in the form. Yeah. And the form that was filled in was incorrect. It said that my mother died in Riga, oh. but there was nothing known about my father. And the implication was that my father had committed suicide on the way. And none of that was true. And it wasn't so many years later that I found out that uh, they had both um, been, we got the exact dates. They were uh, deported from Cologne and then they were sent to Riga and then Chomno. And I discovered that in Germany at the El Day House 
which is now a museum and research center. And the person who told me was this German historian who was so caring and she was so sorrowful to tell me, you know, it wasn't like this uh, academic or a uh, person giving the information in a cold way, you know, here's the paper. She herself felt so much pain about it. There was so much empathy around it, but that's when I found out the truth. And that's what set me off on uh, trying to connect in grief over what really happened. You know? I guess one of the things I wondered is if this journeys, these different journeys you talked about, if that created a sense of continuity for your life, if you felt there was a lack of continuity before, or if that did not make a difference. I think they made a huge difference because I think, I don't know if other um, kinder transport survivors felt this, but you, you don't actually have a feeling of authenticity. You know, yeah. your life is so abnormal. Um, how do you fit in this world? And I feel that making the journeys and going to the physical places um, rooted me in this world. And uh, I could stand there and say, yes, this happened. This was me, you know. Yeah. No, I've, I've heard this before. This is not the first time I've heard that. So I can see that's very important. Um, I guess one of my questions was because I wondered when it comes to working with refugees now, how important it is communication with their, their whatever is left in their families back or wherever their people might be. That's what I was wondering, what the importance of that might, if you can reflect on that at all. Um, yeah, I mean, um, today's refugees, I mean, there are different setups. There are families who are refugees. And yeah, we're thinking children. about unaccompanied children in this situation. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, I mean, it is... Um, the most enormous tragedy, um, and I, I'm, I'm so pained at what has happened in America, you know, I mean, they need not have been separated. There are children who need not have been separated, but then there are other children who have been sent by their parents because, um, like with the kinder transport, they, they felt that this was the only safety. So, um, you know, I'm also very conscious that always when there are ch child refugees, the circumstances are, are there is world upheaval. There is, uh, it's not a normal thing that's happening. And so any uh, kind of, um, thoughts about how can we serve them is we're dealing um, with very limited resources, very limited capacity, and at the base of it, the foundation of it is people who can care for them. I think that is the, the biggest deal, to have an adult who can care for them in such a way that they can just give them a little bit of love. But I think in what can we do, I think one thing is to authenticate their own culture, where they come from, and to really respect that and to help them um, keep that cultural connection. And it speaks to me of, you know, that one of the greatest needs is to have people from their own culture um, kind of involved in the process. Uh -huh. you know, there, there's the whole thing of your own language, your own food, and your own um, ways of doing things, you know. Yeah, so Stephanie. it leads back to the beginning, doesn't it? Because that's what we were talking about, what we were trying to sort of discuss in the report, that, that you do need 
some sort of way of of connecting yourself with the with the other culture with the sort of first culture maybe that you lived in or the originating culture maybe and then connected to the host culture is there anything you want to ask us i don't know whether any i mean i, I shouldn't sort of my my other my fellow is there anything you want to ask, to ask us about the report yeah um can i just give add something to what you were yeah. saying you know um i do feel that the whole question of what how can we help child refugees that are separated is so difficult because um, the resources are so limited. But, um, you know, I think speaking over all the cultural differences and everything is the whole thing of love. I think about that f teacher in that first class in the English school, I don't think she asked me a lot of questions or anything, but you see the whole memory of her, I think she was a loving person and she really cared for me. And I think um, that, that has stayed with me. And maybe what the, child, the refugee child needs today are loving adults who can uh, care about them in a healthy, a healthy love. Mm -hmm. I know, I'm sure, you're, I'm sure you're right. I think that I feel about this is that, that this sort of, I mean, I, I, I don't obviously know whether they always encounter loving adults. I mean, most of the people I know mainly are with their parents or I assume they are with their loving adults. But I, I do think in, in the sort of current situation with Syrian refugees, for example, there again is a sort of lack of, space to actually talk about their experience. I think people are trying to keep that sort of wrapped up almost like almost like the stiff upper lip of the 1930s and 40s because and today it's more to do with yes with the limited resources for psychological support so I think people who support them they don't dare to ask them to open up because they, they know there is no, you know, mental health services are very stretched and all that. So there is yeah. no support. And that's, that, that's my personal opinion. That's what, what, what seems to happen um, nowadays. And, and that's one of the things we're trying to sort of, with this report, we were trying to, we, we did actually present it to some people who, who make sort of policy. So, and hopefully there might be some money behind the policy. So yes. maybe could actually help but, but that's certainly that's certainly the intention so in some ways the report was different from other things we've written in the past which were more for people who were like interested in history and, and, yes. and the refugee experience and and and, uh, and and the kinder transport but now we were trying to write this for people who actually sort of make policy for refugees you know when they were when we launched it there were quite a few interested people there and we don't know you know yet whether it will actually have any consequences yes. it would obviously be nice if it did yes 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 not anything you want to ask stephanie um i have a couple of questions about what you've um said and it's all really really interesting um with the group of refugees in coventry where you spent time and you met with this group occasionally can you remember what you talked about, if you had the impression that they were also going through similar things or what was your kind of impression of their experience? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't remember that we've talked about as children, what we talked about as um, a deep import. Um, the things that I remember is like one, um, I think her name was Hilda Lowenstein. And I remember she was wearing a, a fur, a fluffy fur coat. It must have been cold in winter. And she was telling me that she was going to America. That's one of the big, to her family. And I suppose I felt, um, kind of sad at losing any contact with her and a bit sad that I didn't have anywhere to go, you know. 
so it wasn't a big, uh, we didn't discuss how we felt or anything. I think we just, I, just the fact of being in the same boat and uh, being together and talking just children's stuff, I think that's comforting. Yeah, that's um, really, <laughs> sorry, carry on. And the other thing that I remember is at one of these uh, reunions, uh, this one was actually in America, in Scottsdale, not far from here. And I met uh, a woman who had been called Rita Weber, and she was one of this little group. And uh, she told me her story. And so the, here we are as adults all these years later. And I didn't know this. And so that tells me that we didn't really share what it was like to be with these foster people. But she told me that she actually loved this family that she was with. They didn't have any children and they were very kind to her. And her father had survived and he had, uh, after many different uh, travels, had reached America. And he insisted that she came to join him. And when she came, that's why she lived in America now. But when she actually joined him, his experience in a concentration camp had so affected him, he really wasn't able to care for her. And her mother had died and she went to live with some friends. So for her, that was a bit of a disaster to be pulled out of the foster family who cared for her and then encounter her father who had so changed. You know, I think that's a tragic story that many uh, who meet their parents who have survived also go through. So I, that doesn't exactly answer your story, but I think there was a comfort in just being together as children. You know. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that just almost, um, yeah, not having to speak and just being around those who understand, I think, is something we found in the report as well, that many children found this sort of um, comfort by just being amongst other people who had experienced what they had um, in Germany or Austria as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have another question. I think um, if you look back at your childhood in England, were there any key points maybe within the in the different families that you, you were in, whether you, when you thought, um, or when you reflect back, you think now that that was a turning point or that something in particular made a, a key difference to how you were settling in? I think with the first family, um, the memories that are most vivid uh, could perhaps are not very significant. You know, it's a funny thing with um, my memories, uh, even of Germany, but same with the childhood in England. The memories are not kind of clearly thought out. There were these emotional moments. And um, I noticed in the report, you talk about food is mentioned a lot. And it was the same for me. Like I can remember just, the novelty of foods, uh, negative and positive. And then with that first family, there was a lot of warmth. We were sitting on the carpet. It must have been a low coffee table. And the mother in the family was mashing uh, a banana. And we had the cream from the top of the milk. And she put it on this white bread, which I'd never tasted before, you know, this kind of almost like cake bread. And it was actually very delicious. But I think the deliciousness was because it was like this intimate moment that was not at all complicated and, you know, very pleasant. Um, and I think um, for the second family, um, dramatic change, um, you know, 
um, this is um, kind of, um, this was a dramatic change. You know, I think in many ways, I was a very insecure, fearful person. So although I made this bold move to go to college, when I think about it, I think I was pushed into it. Um, I remember the time when um, I called them auntie and uncle, when my auntie told me that my uncle had said, um, you know, now that I was an adult, the time had come uh, for me to leave, you know, that I could come back like sometimes, but not to call it home anymore. So that was uh, extremely painful. And that was a moment when I was kind of thrown out of this rather prickly nest. And um, that is, I think, one of the things that pushed me uh, to go to college. Yeah. Do you think you were almost looking for other people to, like, a, a group that you could belong to? I don't want to put words in your mouth, so just, yeah. That's very much so. That's very, very true. Because... Uh, after I left teaching and I joined this group that I mentioned and I went to India, this was a group. And I think one of the motivating factors, although I didn't see it at the time, was I was looking for a family, really. <laughs> well, thank you, Hannah. I'm going to sign off for all of us and have a okay. good day. And say right. bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Hannah. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.